there's a quiz like component of like click the patterns or click the styles that you do like or what you don't like or what a, an ideal Saturday night looks for you. Uh, you know, like do you like to go to the club, you like to go for swanky cocktails, you like to you know lounge at home, uh, and then they also lounge actually have home. a little bit of <laughs> me too, of course, yeah. <laughs> Again, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Doing fantastic. Happy Friday. Thanks for having me. Happy Friday as well. It's a beautiful uh, sunny day here in Austin. It's uh, I, I've only been here for a few years, but I hear that it's a lot warmer this year. Definitely for us, like last year, I remember around like Halloween, it was like freezing. Um, so it's like super warm. Last year in Austin. Last year in Austin was nice. I remember. Was it? Uh, for, yeah. It yeah. was two years ago. It was cold and wet. Uh, I might be thinking but yeah, of that. Yeah, last year was actually nice. Okay. Um, I just yeah. remember it was either last year the year before. It was like Halloween because we saw people out trick-or-treating. And we were trying to figure out whether to go out or not. And it was like freezing outside. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I was like, yeah, this is this is wild. Yeah, no, last year I definitely remember was nice because me and my wife wanted to trick or treat. My daughter was Elsa and she was three, was too scared to go into some of the houses. <laughs> right. So we're like, oh, a nice day on Halloween. You kind of, you're lucky to have those. And so yeah. it's a waste. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you are building a uh, quiz um, product for e-commerce stores. Um, how did you uh, get the idea for that? What was kind of the impetus for that? Yeah, sure. So it, it, it's called Prehook. We're focusing just on Shopify stores now uh, as a quiz builder. And the way that I, I came up to the problem, and I'm building it with uh, two co-founders, partners that I met, uh, they were early developers at Jungle Scout. And so we were the early team at Jungle Scout, which is an Amazon product research tool to help people find products to sell on Amazon. And uh, long story short, I was uh, leading the marketing team there, was the first person to take the marketing reins from founder CEO Greg Mercer, who did a fantastic job and really focused on the educational content and the thought leadership part. Uh, but leading the, the, the marketing, uh, one of the things that I was always aware of was uh, in terms of growth was how it related to churn. So as a SaaS product, we relied on recurring revenue, monthly subscriptions. Churn was always a benchmark that I needed to clear in order to guarantee that we'd be growing month over month. Uh, it becomes a, a bigger problem, of course, as the install base gets bigger. Um, in 2019, I started an agency to help B2B SaaS companies reduce churn, which sounds like a big challenge and sh strategically super important. Tactically, that basically broke down into the onboarding phase and onboarding as in helping users identify or helping the, the companies, the SaaS companies ident identify what users were looking for as they signed up, as in like what problem were they trying to solve and help guide them through the onboarding process to that, to that point of the aha moment or the activation so that they get more engaged quickly. Mm. And uh, it kind of started to realize that this was something that e-commerce brands also have a challenge with in terms of understanding what their customers are looking for. So we started speaking, my co-founders Diedrich and As, uh, that this was a, an opportunity, a, a, a need for e-commerce brands as well. And I started to speak with other merchants and learn more about the challenges of how they're actually learning about their customers, what they're getting in terms of data, and then how they're creating segments on the back end, whether with Klaviyo or Omnisend or, or whatever it is that they're communicating with their uh, with their customer base. So yeah, long story short, it was really just that, that we identified the need that merchants and companies just want to have a better channel to get feedback directly from customers. And a quiz is kind of like the first step towards that in terms of creating a, a fun and engaging interactive experience and therefore leading them from there to what the most appropriate or relevant experience or product might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a cool idea because you're kind of gamifying the experience of uh, that customer, you know, giving you more information on them. Um, and it, it, it takes something that, you know, 
uh, instead of just putting them through like a form or whatever, you're giving them something that's kind of fun to do. Uh, and then you're getting a ton of data to kind of segment off of on the back end. Um, what are some, like, what are some of your favorite like quizzes that you've seen that you think do a good job? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that there are, there are different types. And I think the ones that I find most interesting are those that are, are most accessible. Um, but I think the, my favorite quizzes are, and, and where I see maybe like this whole movement going towards is this notion of personalized products. So pros shampoo, for example, or gainful new uh, protein or farmer's dog, which is customized dog food. All these products take inputs from the customer and then create products specific uh, at scale based on the needs of needs that I'm identifying as a shopper. So, oh, wow. you know, if I live in Austin, Texas, for example, it might be dry. I might shampoo my hair every day. I might you know, do all these things. And therefore pros is taking that and then creating a product that, you know, just for me based on my needs. I think that's super exciting and really cool. I think more and more companies are starting to do that in terms of what I'm seeing. Um, maybe one step that's more accessible is SkinSay. So SkinSay is a, a skincare brand, uh, but they, they say it's a personalized skincare brand. So you're, you're answering, I think it's a 27 part holistic quiz. And that includes things like what your diet is, what your skin type is, where you're living, how much you exercise, what your anxiety and sleep, stress levels, all of these things combine to create, you know, me as a, a unique case of needing certain skincare. And what I think is interesting about SkinSay is they have, I, I think it's like uh, three or five or seven uh, unit packages. You know, it's like a cleanser, a, a moisturizer, a, an exfoliant or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but they're creating different permutations based on the quiz. So it's not like they're actually creating a specific product just for me. It's just the, the, what they're picking and choosing from their inventory line that is personalized towards me. Mm -hmm. And so I think like that's more accessible because not everybody can, it's very operationally intensive to scale out manufacturing for you know, units of one per month. But right. if you're able to use a quiz and kind of cherry pick what these data points are and then present to the customer something that is unique to them mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the combination, I think that that's really cool. Um, yeah. My pet in does something very similar as well. They only have four products. I think it's a CBD brand for, um, for dogs. Um, but I yeah. Again, they're personalizing this this experience through the quiz, and I should clarify: like these are not my customers, or you know, I, I'm not affiliated with these. These are just what I see as an observer because I've spent a lot of time going into quizzes and seeing how different brands are using them. Right, that's interesting. Like when you when you talk about um, uh, producing customized products at scale, um, which was like the, sort of the first examples you gave, where they're actually manufacturing i'm guessing the products specific to what a customer needs whether that's you know a supplement you know with certain um uh characteristics to it the actual makeup of the supplement or whatever how do they how do they do i know that's a little off topic from just the quizzes but how do they do you know how they do that how they manufacture in that way yeah so uh pros for example i think like i, I read an article earlier this summer because i think they raised maybe 25 million dollars but Basically, it's as you'd imagine. It's just a huge machine that that uh, that actually manufactures it. Um, and so I'll I'll send you the article so you could add it to the show notes or whatever. Oh. Um, but it is really interesting because it's, I mean, it, it's just creating things kind of like almost what you might imagine of a three D printer, but for shampoo or right. or protein or dog food. Right. Uh, yeah, the farmers farmers dog I, I think that they're really just making the food to order that's wild because I, I I've kind of been interested in like automated manufacturing is kind of a separate thing like you look at how Tesla has automated their manufacturing process and kind of turned a lot of it into like software you know taking things that were just very like physical manufacturing custom-built things and kind of really turned them into software 
And I feel like that's going to happen across every category in the economy eventually. Um, and I was talking to a buddy that uh, works for a, a distributor about some of the things that they, well, they manufacture and distribute. And I'm like, why can't you just 3D print stuff, you know? And I, cause I don't know really anything about manufacturing. I'm just like a developer guy, but, um, I like, you know, I, I, I guess 3d printing works sort of for prototypes for like individual prototypes. Um, but being able to do something at scale is like a totally different thing. Um, like I even looked into phone cases one day, I was like, surely like, like plastic phone cases have to be something that you could mass print at scale. But I, I guess you can't for whatever reason. It's interesting. Well, wait, mass print at scale. Like, like in other words, could okay. you could you have um, could you sell a, a phone case that instead of you know having it manufactured in in typical uh, you know manufacturing centers, you know like in China or whatever, like could you just three D print all of those phone cases and sell them at a competitive price? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really interesting because I've also kind of been looking into print on demand just because I, I want to like, you know, get my hands dirty as well. And so it's right. a nice, easy, low, no investment up front. And it's really almost just like a marketing exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's what Printful does. So Printful has fulfillment centers, I think in like Charlotte, um, LA, Tijuana, and, and across the world, mm -hmm. uh, Barcelona. And so I, I, the way I think is that they, they get the order that comes in it's um the location is identified and then is fulfilled printed and fulfilled from that location that's really? closest to yeah so that's printful.com i think it's really cool uh, i'm excited to try i can report back in a few weeks when i have more uh, hands-on experience but yeah there there are no minimums there are no monthly fees so anybody could literally just like spin up a shopify store it also integrates with magento big commerce etsy and then all of a sudden you're just like basically selling designs and it's it becomes about like how big your audience is, how well you're able to convert <laughs> visitors into shop, into customers. And, um, and really it's kind of like an interesting play now, especially as there are all these like people who are building an audience with content mm. and it's just one, one kind of easy step towards commercializing that audience into Right. Yeah. I think I had, I think I had actually used Printful once for like a t-shirt or like a mug or something, but I didn't realize they were getting into, so you're saying they're getting into printing arbitrary 3d printed objects that you design, a, a, you design an object in, in like 3d software and they just can print arbitrary. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah. Sorry. That, so that, that's, that is a difference. It's, oh, okay. it's more like you have a set number of SKUs in it, but it, you're customizing basically based on the design yeah. in the, the print. Putting your logo so you're right. on a yeah, t-shirt yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think when, when like objects can be 3d printed at scale, um, it's going to change everything, you know, like if a fan, like if a fan can be printed or like, you know, headphone, you know, like anything like that's going to be super interesting. Um, yeah. But, um, but getting back to the quiz stuff, <laughs> um, yeah. how, so, you're building the the product. What kind of stage are you in right now? Are you um, still building it? Is it is it going to be live soon? Yeah, so we are still building it. Uh, I would uh, I would guess probably by you know the beginning of 2021. Uh, you know, as, as your your developer, there's uh, there are always steps, and especially when you're building on the Shopify platform in particular, there's there's a little bit of a learning curve with the Shopify language and framework. And, uh, you know, I might be speaking a little bit out of turn here because I'm not actually developing, uh, my two co-founders are, but, uh, to answer your question, probably, uh, early 2021, I'm hoping. Okay, cool. And so you're more of a marketing, marketing business guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Nice. Nice. What are, um, so what are some of the things that, so I, I was, I was looking, uh, doing a little bit of research. I know Octane AI, is big when it comes to quizzes and stuff like that. What are what are you guys thinking about doing differently? Yeah, so that, that's a good point because Octane AI, AI, I think they launched maybe like a month or so ago. Um, Jebit as well is kind of like an enterprise 
customer experience platform that's moving towards quizzes. And I think what I'm hoping for and from the feedback that I've gotten from merchants is uh, in terms of how granular the product recommendations can be. Uh, because, and I think this is where a quiz can be really interesting and then it can segue to what you're talking about in terms of a, a custom built product. But as a user is going through the quiz, every answer is basically like leaving a breadcrumb towards what they might look, what they might prefer or what their, their goals are or their preferences uh, ultimately would be and how that correlates to the right product recommendation. And so that, that is uh, a, a very difficult challenge, but that's where we're hoping to, to really add a lot of value in terms of uh, on the user end, as in the merchant end, to build out the experience because right now the alternatives like Typeform, for example, it's a, it gets a little bit clunky because you have to basically score each question and then at the very end, based on the score, you know, they can go into one of X number of recommendations. And I think as you're able to get more nuanced and detailed into how each question and the uh, corresponding answer will lead a customer to, um, to the right product, uh, that's, that, that's a, a big value that I've heard. Um, so that's one thing. And then I think also there's an interesting play in terms of like, uh, you know, Clavio is kind of like playing in this space as well, but what would that recommendation be? Or what are the, the different types of personas or segments that are coming here? And what types of people end up doing what behaviors or what products or uh, what feedback? So uh, in terms of differentiation, I think uh, the product recommendation and then what actually happens with the customer data that is gathered mm -hmm. uh, and how they can actually benefit merchants to make more, uh, make better data-driven decisions. Could you give an example? So I, I think I kind of follow what you're saying where like, uh, like maybe uh, some of the other options give more of a simplistic approach of like you got to score each question that takes you to certain products. And yeah, that's like a type form for example. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And could you give like an example of maybe a, a, a walk me through an example of a specific type of a merchant and what types of questions they'd be able to do, what types of flows they'd be able to do that would be maybe a little more nuanced? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, like one one niche that really relies on quizzes is skincare brands. And I think like the reason is, well, first of all, uh, you know, we're, we're in the COVID crisis and pandemic. Going in person to a store is uh, is far harder, and uh, but it's it's really important, of course, to the customer experience and the customer satisfaction that they're finding a foundation finder, for example, that matches your exact skin tone. And so, a quiz is one way. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm not a savvy consumer of this, but there's uh, your your basic like skin tone, and then there's a, a your shade and then a tone and then an undertone. Mm -hmm. And so there's like different nuances. So if you can imagine that there's three times, say five times five, uh, so say like 75 different right. permutations of what this could be. Right. And, and then there are a lot of different skews. Um, Fenty Beauty, for example, which is Rihanna's uh, skincare brand and beauty brand, uh, they're differentiating because they have 50 different foundations. So that's a lot of different foundations with like very slight nuances that's hard to understand when you're behind a screen and you can't actually like put it on your on your skin to see how it fits. Right. Right. Uh, as well as all right, there are let's say seventy five different uh, shade, tone, and undertone matches. So to combine those two to get the perfect match is is very difficult, and that's where. Uh, the quiz and the resulting recommendations can be really helpful towards guiding people to the right product. And then you can imagine, you know, play it forward, like, all right, if I am not happy with what I got as a, con as a customer, do I, do I no longer just become a customer? Or if I am happy, do I buy additional products and do I become a recurring customer? So there's uh, a lot of, I think, direct implications on how it could impact lifetime value and repeat purchases. 
It's interesting. It makes me think of whether there's um, like an augmented reality play specific to skincare products. Cause like you're saying, like you want to see if it matches your skin tone and that's probably hard to do visually, but maybe there's an AR app that can make sure the lighting is all correct and, you know, get the, yeah. get the color matched. Yeah. So skin say actually uh, does have one and I wasn't able to do it. It, it might've been a technical issue. It didn't work. But uh, they, they this do is the have problem that. with stuff like that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. Does, it, does it actually work? Cool in concept uh, execution, probably a, a very challenging problem. Right. It might have been my computer as well. Uh, but yeah, they they do have an option for that. And mind you, I think Skinsay is owned by L'Oreal or Procter and Gamble or a large CP, CPG brand. Um, so it's an interesting example, and they definitely have the the pockets or funding to. Yeah support that yeah one thing i was thinking about with quizzes is like i was looking at some example quizzes and there's some some nice ones that um you know have a nice layout they make it easy for you to visually see what options you're selecting and things like that and there and, and it creates a nice flow but for some reason when i was thinking quizzes i was thinking about like a quiz like a game like the type of thing that like a lot of the quizzes are basically product filter you're basically going through a search process that's boiled into like a couple step form with some images, right? Do you want this? Do you like this? Do you like that? But I was kind of thinking to myself, well, are there quizzes that are like a game that you would do the quiz, like in the way somebody would do a quiz for fun on Facebook or something like that, where like the quiz itself isn't just a search filter to land you on a product, but like the quiz itself is like a fun kind of a game, like content almost in and of itself um that may be tied in a little more indirectly into product recommendations is there anything out there like that yeah i i think that stitch fix is an example of that so stitch fix is a subscription box for for clothing they started i think mainly on women but now they offer stitch fix for men uh but they basically walk you through a quiz and it's 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 far more than a quiz it's almost like a consultation or questionnaire. I think it's actually like 80 something uh, questions. But before you can actually even receive your first stitch fix, stitch fix box, you need to complete this. And it's obvious because there's some basic things like what your size is for shirts, pants, I think maybe even uh, perfume or other things. Um, and that, that's just the very basics. But then it gets far more um, intimate or detailed in terms of what your preferences are. And so there's there's a quiz like component of like click the patterns or click the styles that you do like or what you don't like or what a, an ideal Saturday night looks for you. Uh, you know, like if you like to go to the club, you like to go for swanky cocktails, you like to, you know, lounge at home. Uh, and then they also lounge actually have home. a little bit of <laughs> me too, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then so when you're talking about gamifying it, they actually do gamify it in this Tinder like you know, swipe left or swipe right in terms of a lookbook. Like, do you like this or not like that? And I think where, where this gets really important is, and this is where Stitch Fix, which are they public or multi-billion dollar valuation, they're incredibly successful. But a lot of it is based on the data that they're gathering. And it's almost like um, a data science play because they know what the, what the preference and the interest goals of the customer are upfront. But then after every box they're getting feedback and then kind of like correlating it back to what the initial feedback was. And you can imagine how important the information is upfront, especially for a subscription business every month. Um, you know, they need to make sure that they're sending the right products, especially when you consider what their business model is, which is you're, you're paying a monthly fee, but then also uh, they're making uh, a cut on every piece that you keep. So of course it's in their best interest to send you as many products as you, as they can so that you as a customer are happy, you keep them, you buy them. And you can imagine how that uh, compounds in terms of uh, revenue per customer. And it really all does come back to the data that's gathered in a quiz, which is done in a fun way, like you were alluding to. That's awesome. I like that. Um, I, I like uh, one of the other examples you posted which I thought was super interesting was uh, a, a, a brand that gives you a free, they only give you free shipping if you uh, fill out the quiz. 
Um, and I thought that was so interesting because free shipping is one of these things. It's so standard, gotta have it. It's an expectation. So like, this is the first time I've seen a twist on that where it's like, yeah, you are getting free shipping, but you got to take this little step. It's like a micro step. You don't, you don't have to pay for it, but you're kind of paying for it with data, but it's in like a fun way with a quiz. Um, so I thought that was super interesting as an example of a way to kind of monetize something that's like not monetizable a lot of the time. Totally. Yeah, that, that was actually your skin, uh, which is a, another skincare brand. Funny enough, I don't think that they're doing that anymore because um, I've checked back and I don't see, you know, free shipping if you take the quiz. And it's also funny because in that same screenshot, uh, there was a banner at the top, which is, you know, basically everybody gets free shipping. So it wasn't free shipping for the quiz per se, or at least they didn't coordinate the user experience to make it seem like you have to take the quiz right. to get the free shipping. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think if you think about what the unit economics are, uh, all right, shipping, you know, at skincare, it's not going to be that much. Let's say it's $5. Uh, but how much is the, the lead worth? And how can you, how many leads do you need to convert into a customer? And all of us, all of a sudden you can see that, all right, the quiz, and to get a shopper to take a quiz, uh, let us know as your skin what their skincare problems are, what their daily regimen is, uh, what they're currently using. All these things um, can really help create a far more tailored and stronger marketing campaign down the line. If it's you know if if they don't purchase on site, then they do fill out, uh, they do enter an email address so that that basically. Uh, begins the relationship, the customer journey, where your skin can now create tailored campaigns. It could even just be as many as like three different segments on the back end uh, for you know anti-aging or uh, wrinkles or dark spots or whatever you know their, their customers deal with at a high level. Mm. Uh, they already have the data from the quiz, um, all from offering this you know quid pro quo of free shipping in exchange for sharing this data in the quiz. Yeah. Um, and I should note, like, in some ways, customers want to share this data. Um, there's a study, and I actually forget who did it. It might have been Accenture, but um, a very large percentage, I would say like 70% of shoppers want to provide personal data in order to experience a personalized experience, uh, shopping experience. Right. Uh, so a lot of um, shoppers are looking for this. But there's a, a gap, a customer experience gap, where marketers aren't necessarily fulfilling that promise. So those that do, and those that are able to provide, you know, like um, emails specific to my needs or uh, the the content that I'm looking for to overcome the aging problem that I'm experiencing, uh, that that's a type of experience that we're looking to have, and we're willing to frequent these shops more often. Um, spend more and ultimately have a higher conversion rate and lifetime value. So yeah. I think coming across the data points like that, and again, I can share it with you so that you can have um, your, your audience look at it. It's just really interesting that there are actually dollars behind the value of the data that's gathered, whether it's even in a quiz or a questionnaire or mm -hmm. um, it's like advertising. Like I, I don't want to see ads, but if I'm going to see ads, I'd rather see ads that are relevant to me, you know? So it's like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, show me ads for the categories I'm, I'm actually interested in. Um, I, I'd prefer that, you know? Yeah. Um, when it comes to kind of the data on the back end and the segmenting, like you gave that one example there of, you know, like segmenting people out by, um, you know, age or things like that. What are some interesting things that you've seen or thought about uh, when it comes to taking that quiz data um, and using it in interesting ways? You know, like I can think of basic stuff like you look at gender and maybe you target things that way. Um, but what are some of the interesting things that you've you've seen? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I should preface that I don't know the, the back end of what I'm seeing as a shopper of the quiz. But one that I liked, one question that I liked a lot, and I think it's from the farmer's dog, uh, again, customized pet food, is at the very beginning of the quiz, they, they ask, um, I 
am a believer that healthy food is important or I am skeptical or I don't believe it. And mm. what that does is it, it, it basically helps self-segment, help, helps the quiz taker self-select into uh, may, maybe like where in the funnel they are, mm. which would then lead you as a marketer to think, well, this person does not believe that healthy food is important. And so the, the food of uh, freshly prepared food for a dog, as you might imagine, is far more expensive than what dried kibble from the grocery store would be. So this, this customer would require a lot more problem education and then education around the product itself, mm. as opposed to somebody who might answer, I'm a firm believer that healthy food is important for my dog. That person might go more towards uh, a, a path of um, maybe where this food might compare to um, a similar competitor or how it saves time for the the, the dog owner or other things that aren't so much about convincing the problem at a high level, but at the bottom of the funnel, the marketing campaigns that are most compelling to drive a purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, the other thing I like about the, uh, the quiz is it's a way to, um, drive revenue without offering a discount. And, uh, so much of the time, the, the kind of the, 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 techniques and tactics that you would use to kind of bump conversion rates and things like that relate to a discount, right? Maybe it's SMS, maybe it's email, maybe it's a welcome sign up, whatever. Um, what are some other ways that you can think of other than this, um, that merchants can, you know, offer incentives and things like that, that don't involve a discount or how should, how should, like I was talking to somebody about SMS marketing and they were like, you know, I'd love to do it, but you kind of have to do a discount to do SMS marketing. This just kind of seems to be the way it's done. And and for brands that are sensitive about discounting, like what are some things that they should be thinking about? Yeah. So there are some companies that require a quiz in order to purchase. And so I, the, the, another example is Wink, in direct to consumer wine. And, uh, Stitch Fix or or anything that's like a customized product, and there of course it makes sense because in order to complete the fulfillment, fulfill the, the order, you need to understand at least you know is it a red wine, a white wine, a, a cab, a chardonnay, whatever. Um, but th that's one way, at least in order to get users to uh, enter their email address and 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 enter some basic information. Of course, there's uh, they aren't compelled to purchase once they start the quiz. Uh, but that's that's one way to kind of guide everybody towards uh, the same path. Uh, the in terms of other other incentives to take a quiz, I think it, it might come down to uh, like simple copywriting, uh, basically like create enough curiosity or intrigue, and I think that's where quiz is really interesting mm. is because it just incites this natural curiosity of us as humans to learn more about ourselves and maybe learn like, all right, if I complete this, then I'll know what my perfect fill in the blank, you know, the perfect golf ball title is, has a golf ball fitter or, mm. you know, my, my perfect uh, lotion or Hawthorne does men's products customized, you know, based on my needs. And so I think that's where you can you can tweak enough uh, curiosity and intrigue in the headline, um, make that gap, that curiosity gap, strong enough. Then you're getting users to take the quiz. Uh, you know, honestly, I, I don't know if that will be as strong as a 10, 15% discount, um, but it is one way to to compel more people mm -hmm. to take a quiz without offering a discount. Yeah. The other thing related to discounting, I, I, I saw you posted recently that I thought was interesting was you were kind of asking the question about um, discount strategies related to geographic location. Uh, so somebody is geographically located in, in an area where shipping is just naturally like going to be less expensive to them. Can you identify them and then give them some kind of a discount based on that? I thought it was a was an interesting idea. I don't know if you ended up figuring that out or not. No, I, I don't. Do you have an answer? I don't. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> hopefully somebody on the internet will figure that out. And let us know. Well, you know, now that I think about it, maybe 
maybe you know it, if you are there there are many quizzes that will ask you uh where you live just simply because it, it they can't fulfill outside of certain areas at the moment uh, you know maybe the, the the country is divided up into you know thirds or fifths and then therefore there might be like high level shipping rates based on what checkout flow they go through you know, spitball yeah. in there, but maybe that's, that's an option. Yeah, no, I have a buddy that, um, is a trucker and, uh, he wanted to move to this area outside of Reno because that's like the main hub for truckers. Like if you work for Walmart or whatever, everybody works there. And so like, that's like the place to be. It makes all these trucking jobs really simple and stuff like that. So I'm sure if, you, I'm sure if you're in some kind of a hub, everything is real cheap to ship to. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, so you uh, you have a podcast, Cart Overflow, which I love the name, by the way. It's a great name. Uh, reminds me of Stack Overflow. How's that going for you? How did you get that started? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's been fun. Um, it was, it, I started with my buddy, Jeremy, who I know from Jungle Scout, and he's also working on a Shopify app. And, uh, you know, I, I was in e-commerce SaaS e-commerce before focusing a lot on Amazon, like I was saying, you know, with marketing at Jungle Scout, a little bit different when it's it's not so much centered around this behemoth of Amazon and, and the the challenges of a, a standalone brand on say Shopify are very different. So I approached it really as a a way to uh, learn more from leading operators and and people with you know in the weeds and share those learnings and so it's been it's been tremendously fun uh it was also kind of like a, a covid related project as well uh in the house people are in the house so maybe it might be uh people are more willing to spend time and frankly like new connections speaking with new people like you doing cool things uh has been really inspiring and energizing and, and so i'm having a great time uh you know not seasoned by any means like you i, I i'm uh, you know, maybe 25 episodes in, but I'd like to con continue into the foreseeable future. Uh, but yeah, I, I try to um, just speak with as many people and, and I'm just curious to hear how they're doing. And people have been tremendously uh, transparent and helpful in terms of sharing their learnings and, and how they're actually approaching things, the different uh, challenges that they're addressing. And I, I just like to... Uh, publish it, you know, audio version, but then also some write-ups and, and everything else. That's awesome. Yeah. I've had a similar thing recently where I've been doing more of these, uh, with COVID. I've just, it's like, I, I feel like I want to connect more with people and that's kind of part of the reason I've been doing more of them. And, uh, it's, um, you know, it, it it's, uh, it can be hard, right. To connect over the internet and video. Like, I, I don't know. I think there's, kind of an art to it you know there's zoom fatigue and stuff like that and then sometimes it's better just hang out in person um but i think that it can you know depending on how you do it it can be a good option you know to stay connected yeah yeah absolutely and i and i think i i'm not necessarily like the mo the first person to like you know raise my hand or go out there and and not necessarily public in that sense but it, it's just been uh, fun and I think getting more comfortable as well in doing that is a step towards like personal development that I was hoping to achieve as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I go through the editing process and I, I use a script and it's like you can remove all filler words like you know at once. And it's both awesome because it's so easy, but then painful. Like, oh man, all these filler <laughs> words in there that I got to d delete. Yeah, 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 yeah. The script is wild. I mean, the overdub feature and like all the stuff they're doing is incredible. I, I love it. I actually don't use the overdub that much. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just, it doesn't quite sound totally natural, right. uh, at least from the way I've completed it. But what is awesome is that the audio automatically transcribes and then therefore you can edit the audio recording based on what the text is. And I mm -hmm. think that's just a huge time saver and it's easy to export the video, the audio, the um, subtitles. Yeah. And on the, on the podcast, are you um, interviewing a combination of merchants and other uh, vendors and stuff like that in the ecosystem? Yeah. Yeah. It's been... 
operators, uh, so you know, whether founders or, or people, it's focused on marketing, uh, marketers or agency folks or uh, vendors. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Um, I saw that, uh, I think you posted about like live stream selling recently, uh, you posted a link to an article and that's something I've seen, um, uh, bubbling up recently. I think a uh, singles day happened somewhat recently, uh, the big yeah. live stream, uh, selling event in China. And it seems like that's probably going to start to become a thing here in the, in the, in, in the U S right. I, I think so. And whether it's live streaming or not, another bad COVID COVID related habit is like I discovered TikTok and right. probably <laughs> lose a, a fair amount of time to it. But then I also see like, all right, you, you thumb through and then you see like live video. And, and so it's really just like people kind of like chatting and engaging with their audience. I haven't seen as much direct uh, selling, um, but you can easily take the leap of imagination that, all right, they're actually like, picking a random product that they're actually using. And it's very much like a, an affiliate model. It's just a, a different platform and a different channel. Uh, but I, I do think that it's, it's going to be uh, the case. And I think, you know, changes that Instagram is making or, or made in terms of facilitating commerce within the platform, TikTok's probably going to be there. And yeah, what, what's happening in China where they are a little bit more advanced or a little more, uh, maybe reliant or used to e-commerce. Um, and if you look at the numbers, it bears out to tell that story in terms of e-commerce sales as opposed or as a part of total retail. Uh, and so there's definitely a lot more growth uh, that I think we're edging towards in the States where whether, whether it's live video sales or I've even, um, one of my friends is now involved in this uh, app that actually has um, where it used to, where it would be just a chat it's a live video and, and you see videos embedded on product description pages. This is more just like an actual live salesperson, which makes sense for a, a product that's a high average order value mm. where you do kind of want to speak with a real person, have a, a real dialogue, <laughs> you know, like we'll consider it an old school quiz where you're, you're speaking to somebody who's knowledgeable about the product can answer any questions or objections that you might have. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of those things I thought I, I'd imagine existing for a while where it's just like, you kind of want to reproduce the experience of like the in-store sales rep coming up and talking to you kind of a thing, but it hasn't quite materialized, you know, maybe like you said, it makes sense. Higher ticket. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think we will see them and, and, uh, this company, I forget the name, but it's in, it's in beta and I, I think they're testing in a few stores. Nice. Yeah. There's this, um, there's this product I've seen. Um, actually there's, there's a, there's a couple of guys building this product called welder, which is for recording video and they've built a couple of things. And, uh, one of them, um, has like, um, it's almost like a chat widget in the bottom right corner of the screen, but there's a video, it's like a video chat widget. So it'll show like a video of them and then you'll click into it. And it'll ask you a question like it's basically like kind of a quiz segmentation thing, but each question has a video associated to it. Um, so it's a little more engaging. Have you seen that one? Inter no. Yeah. No, I haven't. I'll shoot that over to you. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. So TikTok, are you liking TikTok? Are you, are you following down the rabbit hole? Uh, I, I'm trying not to. And even worse, I, I do it with my daughter just to see some of these, <laughs> okay. like these filters, you know, she loves the filters. Oh my God. Um, my but, kids I, but I'm love very careful filters. not to like, yeah, yeah Snapchat and, and TikTok filters. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I am trying to be cognizant of not showing her the content that's created because I think, you know, like we do enough screen time as it is. And, and I think, you know, like that's a whole, whole other topic is social media and young girls. I know you have a couple um, yeah. who are a little bit older, minus four and a half. But yeah, TikTok, I do I do find really interesting. I actually on the podcast spoke with Brandon Doyle of Wallaroo Media recently. And um, he's, he's really into TikTok in terms of creating organic content for his clients, as well as some of the paid stuff. And from what I heard, it's just, uh, it really is fascinating in how, how the the app works and how they actually value content. Uh, and so one of the interesting things, for example, is that regardless of how big your audience is, that it's really just that, that one video. So it's, you know, where LinkedIn, for example, might 
favor somebody who has a lot of uh, followers and, and therefore get more, give more credence or, or weight, show that post more often. But TikTok is really uh, holistic in terms of the video itself. Is it shareable? Is it watchable? Is it rewatchable? And then that's kind of like an early indication. And then so things, the virality of it and, and um, how you can um, amount views, followers, and uh, per one of Brandon's examples, uh, where he was running, uh, one of his clients was running Instagram ads and TikTok ads uh, and organic on both channels. Um, TikTok far outperformed uh, what Instagram was doing. And uh, there, there are some limitations still in terms of what targeting is or what the conversion uh, conversion tracking is. But it's, uh, yeah, he, he was very long on TikTok. And from what I heard, I can certainly see why. And, yeah. and from what I experienced as a consumer, right? You're just like <laughs> flipping through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like it's very addictive. I haven't dug into it too much uh, <laughs> to date. But uh, yeah, they seem to have uh, really figured out something with the algorithm to get people. I think they do certain things where when you initially go on, they give you a boost in distribution. So you kind of get hooked. Um, I did play around with it maybe, I don't know, nine months ago or so. I was putting out some video. Like Gary V was talking about it. So I started putting out some videos and uh, the first few got, you know, I don't know, a few hundred views um, and then it kind of dropped off. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating platform. I don't know what's going on with the whole U.S. acquiring TikTok. Like, I think Microsoft was going to do it. I, don't, I, I lost track of that whole deal. Oh um, man, now we're getting into politics. <laughs> yeah, we got to be. Yeah, careful. because you know, like, I I don't know either. And and frankly, I I wouldn't be surprised if it was just almost a, a, a ruse or a tactic to divert attention. But yeah, I don't know what happened with that. The thing that seemed interesting to me is that I, I think at one point, it, uh, my understanding was that they were going to acquire the platform, but not the algorithm. Like they weren't going to get the algorithm; they were just going to get the data or something like that. And I was like, the algorithm is is massive. Like everything you're talking about is all the algorithm um, that seems to work so well to to create like virality in a way that other platforms don't. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. anyways, it's interesting. Um, well, again, thank you so much. It was really good to have you on. I appreciate you taking some time and, Likewise. Uh, yeah, this was a ton of fun. Yeah, man. Where's the best place for people to find you online? Yeah. So my, my Twitter is just, uh, Gen, G E N Furukawa, F U R U K A W A, um, or just email Gen at G E N at prehook.com. And yeah, if there are any questions about quizzes or, or whatever, want to chat about them happy to do so uh, and it's prehook.com for the product itself <laughs>